Thank you for listening to the Damage Report podcast, the show covering the true threats facing our country and what you can actually do about them. You can support this free podcast by leaving us a review and giving us a five star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you happen to be listening to it. Every review helps more people discover the show at no cost to you. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Damage Report. I am John Adderall. It is Thursday and we've got a big show for you. In studio, I am going to be solo, but a little bit later on in the show, we are going to be joined by two guests via Skype doing amazing reporting. One for the nation, the other for the intercept. We're going to have Dave Lindorf and Kate Aronoff coming on the show to talk about two gigantic stories. In the first, the Pentagon, a ridiculous amount of either accounting fraud or complete incompetence. Neither is uh, you know, acceptable considering the numbers that we're gonna be talking about. Um, but how deceptive intentionally are we talking about here and how far back does it go? We're gonna be talking about that. And then a little bit later on, we're having this discussion around the country about a Green New Deal. If it does actually happen, what could our country look like in a couple of decades? Kerry Aronoff is gonna be sketching that up for us. And uh, where we actually go from here in getting something like a Green New Deal actually passed. Along the way, lots of news to cover. In the first segment, we're gonna be doing a deep dive into some of the election fraud going on right now in North Carolina, including what I think might be the most blatantly partisan piece of legislation that I've actually seen. Wait until you see this. It is insane that they think that they can get away with this in North Carolina. Uh, Later on, more news on climate change. Is it good, is it bad? If you've been paying attention to the state of the world, you could probably guess. And then we're gonna be closing out the show with something fun, Donald Trump. Is he actually religious? We're gonna look into the evidence and decide, is he as religious as he says he is? Has he earned the vote of the evangelicals who supported him overwhelmingly in 2016? So uh, lots to get to obviously, so we're gonna jump right into it. Republicans say that they care about voter fraud, about election fraud, about the integrity of our elections. And yet right now in North Carolina, we are seeing an incredible scandal unfolding day by day that for some reason, Nationally, the Republicans just don't care about. You know, they're talking about reindeer and they're talking about toys and stuff like that on Fox News. I'm not even joking, they're literally doing segments on those things and not paying attention to what's going on in the 9th Congressional District of North Carolina. So we're gonna break it down now because we're looking at potentially a new election needing to be called because of how bad the electoral fraud actually was. So first of all, what do we have? Well, there was two candidates, the Republican Mark Harris and the Democrat Dan McCready. And with the votes tallied the way they are right now, the Republican Mark Harris actually won with 905 votes. That is an incredibly close election. But in these midterms, we saw a number of different incredibly close elections. So that by itself isn't all that shocking. But when you start looking at various ways that those votes came in, there is a lot of cause for concern. And primarily, we're gonna be talking about absentee ballots, people who did not actually go to the polls on the day to vote, they either voted by mail or their absentee ballot was, um, you know, given by one of their like sworn, like a relative or something like that, a representative, and handed in. That's a thing that happens around the country, and it's supposed to be a smooth process. Doesn't generally uh, generate much controversy, uh, but in North Carolina, it has. Let's talk about why. Uh, Democratic officials were able to track down voters in uh, Bladen County in that ninth congressional district who claim that non-family members came to their house and promised to deliver their ballots to the state for counting. This practice known as ballot harvesting is illegal in the state of North Carolina. So to the extent that this can be proven, I mean, the people are saying that someone came, told them that they would take their ballot, they did, the ballot went out. That was a crime that was committed. So there's no question at this point that criminal behavior is going on. The question only is how high does it go? Who is actually responsible for this? Were there well-meaning citizens who were thinking, you know what? I wanna help out the elderly. I'm gonna go door to door asking if anybody has an absentee ballot. Maybe that's a weird new form of electoral trick or treating. I honestly don't know. Um, Or it could be that they were ordered to do that. Uh, Let's go farther. At least one voter further claimed that she handed over her ballot even though it wasn't completely filled out and it wasn't sealed. So at that point, best case scenario, what is going on is illegal and is going to lead to potentially her vote not counting because it's not fully uh, 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 marked down and all that. Or it could be that if you're taking those envelopes, you have access to it, they're not sealed, it's not fully uh, you know, filled out. You could fill it out yourself. Maybe the votes are going in the wrong direction. Now I would say in general, don't hand over your absentee ballot to a random person and you know, fill it out yourself before you do it. But What is going on right now potentially with as narrow of a margin as it was could be significant. 
Let's talk about one individual. Ginger Eason admitted on camera that she was paid to collect ballots from people who weren't her near relative or whom she doesn't have legal guardianship over. So this is the ballot harvesting we're talking about. That she is saying that this was not just something she chose to do, this is something she was paid to do. And she admitted that she didn't actually send the ballots she collected to the state. She handed them to a paid contractor for Harris's campaign, Leslie McRae Dowless, who paid her for her efforts. So Leslie McRae Dowless is a good person we're gonna return to in just a moment. But think about what we have here with Ginger Eason. Do you believe that Ginger Eason, assuming she's telling the truth, was the only person that was paid to do what she did? Well, when we're talking about this guy, Leslie, understand that the sums are gigantic. I think it was the second highest paid contractor by the Harris campaign in the entire election. So what did that money go to do? If it went to pay one person, could it have been given to pay many people? Is it possible that these spontaneous absentee ballot harvesters were actually a coordinated campaign? Is that really so crazy considering the evidence we're looking at? And now this individual, let's, let's learn a little bit more about Leslie McRae Dowless. Served a prison sentence for felony fraud. So that's a, that's a bad sign when it comes to the possibility of election fraud. Um, accused of questionable activity concerning absentee ballots back in the 2016 primary. So earlier when we talked about this story, I believe it was the beginning of this week, we talked about how uh, Harris has a ridiculous amount of absentee ballots in this election. We're gonna give you the numbers in a second. Also in the primary earlier this year, really weird behavior specifically with absentee ballots. Now we find out it was also a problem in 2016. And the unifying like factor in all of these was Dowless. Now in 2016, if we can bring this back up, Dowless's candidate in that election got 98% of the absentee vote by mail in Bladen County. So those are the votes that potentially could have been intercepted. In 2018, not quite as successful, that is Mark Harris got 96% of absentee vote by mail in Bladen County. So man, there is just something about Bladen County that when they go for a candidate, they really go for a candidate in a way that is difficult to actually ensure was legitimate. So let's talk about another reason why it seems so weird that Mark Harris, this Republican pastor, would have gotten 96% of the absentee vote in Bladen County. So Bladen, what, what is it? Is it the most Republican place in the country? Is it Trump land USA? Actually, 42% of the people there are registered Democrats. 39% are unaffiliated. Only 19% are actually registered as Republicans. But despite the fact that there are more than twice as many registered Democrats as Republicans, those voters favored Mark Harris by 24 points. And along the way, voted absentee at a much higher rate than the rest of the state. Something like 7% of the vote overall was absentee. In most of the counties in that district, it was less than 3%. So they both really like Mark Harris and they really like voting without having to go into the, the, the ballot box, which is a little bit odd as well. So look, really suspicious behavior. There is reason to believe that money was changing hands to change the results of these absentee ballots that some potentially were being changed between when they're handed to one of these gatherers and when the gatherer gives it to somebody, we don't even know who, not the state apparently. So that is suspicious. It's also suspicious that we talked about in our last reporting on this, that a number of the absentee ballots that were given in can't be found. And so are those evenly distributed across all candidates? Or is it possible that that's one of the ways that you get to 96% voting for one candidate? That you're going into and destroying the, the ballots that voted for the other candidate. So look, really suspicious, lots of reasons to believe that the, the results are not legitimate. So what should be done? Well, the state's two largest newspapers are calling for a new election. This is not just you know some rando blog. This is the Rally News and Observer and the Charlotte Observer two of the state's largest newspapers calling for that. Um, and also, uh, I happened to see, uh, not, not long before we actually went live, that um, one of the state leaders in the Republican Party is also saying that if there is proof of election fraud, that they also support a new election. And so look, that could play out in a couple of different ways. You could have you know, a rematch where Mark Harris and Dan McCready go toe to toe again, hopefully without Dowless getting involved. But if it turns out that these people were being paid, if Dowless was paying to get them to manipulate the vote, and if he was being paid by the Harris campaign, did he? Did Harris know? Was this a coordinated thing? Or does he just know that Dowless is a fixer when it comes to absentee ballots? 
So they might have to do some investigation, the communication between Mark Harris's campaign and this contractor. Was he truly independent in his activities or did the candidate actually know? Because if he did know, then we might well need another election, but we might also need another Republican candidate to run in it. So this is the sort of story that should be overwhelming news coverage around the country. And to some extent it is, like MSNBC is talking about it, online it's a big story. But Fox News, the people who want you to be terrified about whether your vote actually counts, whether illegals are coming in, they're just there's just looking at the birds, I mean, there's some flowers out the window. They just don't see it and they don't care. They can't even pretend to care at this point. Okay, uh, we have a break coming up in just a minute. I wanted to mention one other quick thing though. Uh, we've been talking about this freshman orientation period that the incoming uh, newly elected congressmen and women are going through in DC. And I saw that uh, Alexandria Casa Cortez just a few minutes ago actually tweeted out another component of this that is fascinating. She said, uh, right now, freshman members of Congress are at a bipartisan orientation with briefings on issues. There are invited panelists offering insight to inform new Congress members' views as they prepare to legislate. So they bring in these people to talk to these people who are gonna be voting on bills, they're gonna be writing their new bills. So far, the number of corporate CEOs that have been panelists, four. The number of labor leaders, a zero. So look, at this point, I mean, these are educated people. You know, They have a political ideology. I don't know how overly swayed they're gonna be by the, the speakers that are brought in to talk to them. But it certainly does show that the people setting up this orientation. We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un the Republic, or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be, featuring in-depth research, razor-sharp commentary, and just the right amount of vulgarity the UNFTR podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows. But don't just take my word for it. The New York Times described UNFTR as consistently compelling and educational, aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school. For as the great philosopher Yoda once put it, you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. ...come at it from a very particular point of view. And uh, that could theoretically lead to uh, certain types of legislation being pushed and certain types not. Okay, we're gonna take our first break. When we come back, Dave Lindorf is gonna join us. Accounting fraud at the Pentagon, how big is it? How far back does it go after this? So what the hell is going on at the Pentagon? Uh, recent report in the nation, amazing accounting fraud going on. Literally billions, trillions of dollars, seemingly unaccounted for, perhaps unaccountable. Let's try to make some sense of it. We've got a Dave Lindorf joining us, both investigative reporter, longtime contributor to the nation who wrote up that report. Dave, welcome to the show. Dave, thank you again for joining us on the Damage Report. Very excited to have you here. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So look, your report was amazing, very widely spread. You're talking basically about the Pentagon undergoing an audit and it looks like it went about as poorly as it could have. Is that is that a valid interpretation? It was a total failure. The only thing, Excuse me. The only thing that they accounted properly was the uh, retirement fund. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, what are the, the what are the numbers that we're talking about here? Well, I mean, first of all, there was a study by a professor at Michigan State University, Mark Skidmore, who specializes in public account, public agency accounting, and he went through all the reports that were done on parts parts of the Pentagon budget over the course of 1998 to 1915 and to 2015, and he found 21 trillion dollars in entries on the. Uh, liability and asset side of the Pentagon's financial documents that 
uh, could not be accounted for, couldn't be, uh, you know, backed up by any kind of uh, ledgers. And uh, they basically make render the budgets uh, completely useless for any purpose at all. Yeah, and it's certainly consequential when it comes to deciding how much Congress should should give the military, which we'll return to. Um, but that that twenty one trillion dollar number, obviously, that's 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 a big draw to attention. I mean, that that's more than the military was budgeted over that time. Now, now we don't think, and correct me if I'm wrong, we don't think that they've actually lost twenty one trillion dollars, but potentially a, a significant portion of that could actually be money that you know went. You know, into the dark. Maybe, maybe somebody has it. Maybe it was spent on something. I mean, the numbers are still significant, even if not twenty-one trillion dollars. Well, as Professor Skidmore points out, you can't really know anything about it because the Pentagon won't tell us anything about it. Uh, the it, it, what I've been told from my sources for the article, uh, which included people who have worked for years in the Pentagon, uh, people who've retired and are speaking on the record, uh, like Jack Armstrong, who was supervising the audits by the uh, Pentagon's Office of Inspector General for five years, uh, ending in 2011. Uh, Chuck Spinney, who is a celebrated whistleblower who worked in the Pentagon and did his reports with his name attached uh, back in the 80s, exposing epic scandals and fraud. Uh, all these people have told me that it appears that uh, what the Pentagon's doing is making up the numbers and trying to paralyze Congress and the media so that they uh, can't really figure out what's happening at the Pentagon. And it works for the Pentagon. They they basically give Congress uh, the financial reports for the current year and the prior year. And then they ask for more money. Uh, and, the, and the Congress looks at these uh, prior year spending, which looks like they spent all the money they got and then some, uh, when in fact they probably didn't. Yeah. And then what happens is they, they can take, they get more money, because that's the way Congress works. You ask for what you had last year plus some, and uh, and then the uh, the military can take that extra money that they really didn't spend from the prior year, and it goes into uh, hidden accounts, gets uh, what they call nippered away into uh, other parts of the budget. They turn one-year money into five-year money, don't return it to Congress as they're supposed to, and then uh, nobody knows what they do with it, and they can do anything they want with it if nobody's looking. I, you know, I'm glad that you mentioned the, the nippering because the, these terms, plugs and nippering, <coughs> like it would be easy for some people to look at this and think, oh, they're incompetent. You know, they lose records, they don't keep track of things very carefully, but they actually have this sort of terminology built up around a systematized way that every year we can expect that huge chunks of money are being hidden from the eye of the public, the eye of Congress. So th this doesn't seem like it's just incompetence. It seems like this is, uh, this is by design. Yeah, look, uh, I, it, it's been going on for over two decades. It's that's a generation, uh, and no one's ever called them out on it. That uh, the numbers have never been reported in the mainstream press. Uh, Skidmore's report about twenty-one trillion dollars. You never read about it. First time it made it into the uh, the mainstream media was when uh, Representative Elect uh, Ocasio Cortez tweeted out about $21 trillion in, in hidden money that could have covered half the cost of 10 years of Medicare for all. What she got wrong was that she said it is missing money. We say <clears throat> we don't know what it is. It might be real money. Some of it might be real money. It might be, and I think more likely, it's fake numbers to inflate the uh, amount that they say they're spending to Congress. Um, but whatever it is, she, she managed to get that 21 trillion figure in the Washington Post, which never reported it before. And, and their yeah. fact checker said it's correct, that Skidmore is correct and our article is correct. So thank you for getting it in the mainstream. Yeah, I mean that 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 is one of uh, AOC's skills right now, and is getting people to focus on this stuff. I, you know, I would love for her to go in and uh, sort of lead a new, more vigorous audit of the Pentagon. I, I know that she's really busy with Green New Deal and all that stuff, but um, I want to talk about sort of the stakes, why, why this is important, because you talk about a couple of different things in your article that I find really important. Um, the amount that we spend on defense is what we would spend if hypothetically a world war was going on. But right. as you point out, the only the biggest war we're involved in 
has about 3% the level of troops in Afghanistan right now that we had in Vietnam, but we're spending far more. Um, to what extent do you think that these fishy accounting practices can help to explain why defense spending never actually, you know, we never got that peace dividend. A after the Cold War was over, it never actually went down drastically. No, and I think that these fake numbers, I write in the article that I think that these fake numbers are a major contributor because what they do is they um, allow the Pentagon to come in and say, as I said, uh, you know, we spend all this money when they maybe really didn't spend all the money. And it's it's a, like an escalator every year that uh, Congress has the, uh, you can either call it the, the uh, justification or the rationale or the excuse to give the Pentagon more money the next year. And, uh, and remember that $350 billion a year goes to the arms uh, industry that, uh, which is more than half of the, uh, of the entire military budget, right? Yeah. Uh, so this is an enormous amount of money that's being shoveled out for things that we really don't need. We're never going to, you know, it, unless we have World War III, which, you know, nobody wants, we're not going to ever see all those thousands of uh, $150 million jets, the F-35 uh, flying turkey that Lockheed Martin is making. Mm -hmm. And yet, uh, you know, that enormous expense includes contractor support funding that even the Air Force says they can't track how it's being used by uh, Lockheed Martin. Yeah. The, the accounting is so uh, completely off the wall at the Pentagon that I don't, I'm not even sure that the leadership in the Pentagon knows where the money that they're supposed to be managing is going. Uh, I mean, just look at Rumsfeld in 2001. He's the only Secretary of Defense who's called out this uh, accounting fiasco uh, when he, on September 10th, said he had discovered $2.3 trillion in uh, financial uh, financial transactions that they couldn't explain or back up. And he called it a life and death matter to find out what it was yeah. and said, uh, it, the enemy isn't China or Russia, it's the Pentagon bureaucracy. That, of course, big story that night uh, on the networks, a big story in the newspapers in the morning. And then you know, the buildings went down and so did that story. And it hasn't been picked up by any defense secretary since. Well, hopefully now as a result of your reporting and some politicians are beginning to talk about it, uh, it might. So Dave Lindorf, thank you again for your work. Uh, great reporting there in the nation and thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me on. Thank you. We are gonna take a short break. When we come back, uh, new news on climate change, uh, melting in Greenland. How's it going over there? We'll let you know on the other side. Welcome back to the show, everybody. We've got lots more news to get to. Before that, though, I do want to let you know about just a couple of different things. Some of you watching this, you might be live watching it on our member stream, uh, but others might be listening to the podcast or uh, at the YouTube channel at youtube.com uh, slash The Damage Report. And if that's the case, uh, if you'd like to become a member of TYT, now is a great time to do it. And there's two different ways you can do that. Uh, I recommend that you go to tyt.com slash John to become a member. It uh, both supports TYT, gives you access to progressive Netflix, and uh, gives me one higher number in the contest we're going on, which certainly doesn't look bad for me, and the sort of reporting that you see on the damage report. But also, if you'd like to give it a try and you're not ready to commit just yet, you can go to tyt.com slash holiday and get a one week free trial. That is one week of basically a full day, every day of progressive news, a number of different shows, special features as well. And uh, if you time it well, you might actually have access to our Hostmates game show that we filmed uh, for this holiday season, where uh, pairs of TYT hosts competed against each other to see how well they know each other. Uh, Brooke Thomas, who uh, hosts uh, the Monday edition of The Damage Report, was actually my guest, and it was a lot of fun. You're definitely gonna wanna see that. So either tyt.com slash John or slash holiday to become a member and get access to that sort of content. With that said, let's jump back into the news. If you're watching the damage report, the possibility that you don't believe in climate change seems a little bit low, but just in case there are some holdouts, I wanna give you a little bit more evidence that things are looking bad and they're looking bad increasingly fast. Let's talk about Greenland today. Can we bring up this uh, picture? You're gonna see Greenland, in case you don't know what it looks like, it's importantly not that green. It's actually pretty white and blue because it's 80% covered by ice, an actually amazing amount 
of ice on Greenland. And you know what? I like that it's on Greenland because if it's on Greenland, it's not in the ocean. Because if it was in the ocean, that would be really bad. Unfortunately, Greenland disagrees with me and it wants to diversify a little bit. And so lately, it has been melting in record numbers. Uh, According to uh, Luke Trussell, glaciologist at Rowan University, that's a thing, um, says melting of the Greenland ice sheet has gone into overdrive. Greenland melt is adding to sea level more than any time during the last three and a half centuries, if not thousands of years. So, and look, I know some people... Some people who are never going to believe in climate change will respond, well, how do they know what happened thousands of years ago? There were no scientists then. Uh, That's not actually how it works. Uh, They do ice core drilling to look at samples. Uh, You can track periods of melt and stability over time going back hundreds, thousands, and even more uh, years. And so they've done that. So uh, to give you an idea of more recently, the melt rate over the past two decades was 33% higher than the 20th century average and 50% higher than in the pre-industrial era just uh, before before the mid-1800s, I should say. So this is something that is speeding up overall. It's speeding up even more if you look just recently. That is a ton of ice that we cannot afford to have going into the ocean. But you're just talking about melt rates, uh, that, that doesn't necessarily really drive home the message. We're supposed to choose arbitrary units of measurement, so uh, we've got one for you. Uh, in just one year, back in 2012, enough ice melted in, into the water to fill up some 240 million Olympic swimming pools. So uh, that's also difficult to imagine, but I think you get the idea. It's a lot. And uh, it depends on who you talk to, how bad it could be. But hypothetically, if the melt gets as bad as it looks like it's going to, within the next 70 years or so, the amount of ice that is on Greenland right now, were it all to melt in, could raise the average sea level something like, I believe, a half a meter. That is one of the estimates that I've seen. Obviously, those uh, differ widely between scientists, um, but we cannot afford that. Even four inches, you might have heard referenced in the uh, Bernie Sanders Climate Town Hall on Monday, Four inches would cause 10 million people around the globe to need to evacuate. So imagine half a meter at that point, obviously far more. And uh, understand that while there are a lot of things contributing to global sea level rise, uh, ice loss from Greenland is actually the single largest contributor right now. It's not one that's often talked about. We talk about you know, the free-floating sea ice in the Arctic. We talk about Antarctic sea ice as well. Whenever you know, something in the Larsen shelf breaks off, it's gigantic Delaware-sized things. That's usually the unit of measurement we use. That's big, but Greenland is melting too, and we cannot afford to let that happen. So what can you actually do about it? Well, you can't go and like refrigerate Greenland. That's not going to work at this point. We need a political solution, and you can be part of it. Uh, if you go to sunrisemovement.org, that is a group of young climate activists working to address the threat of climate change in the time frame that we actually have. Supposedly, we have something like 12 years to institute a Green New Deal to really address uh, climate change. They're working to do that. So if you go to that website, sunrisemovement.org, you're going to see a couple of different things. You can sign up to stay informed on the issues and developments, both environmental and political, around this issue. They have a number of different ways that you could contact your representative. And by the way, now is like the critical time to do that. In the same way that, you know, during the Kavanaugh hearings, we had to let them know what we thought about that. This is the time to do it on climate change and a Green New Deal. Because right now, as you saw in that uh, footage, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez and others are going around trying to get uh, congressmen and women and senators to sign on to this select uh, committee on the Green New Deal. We need to put pressure on them. They need to know that their political futures rest on supporting this. Whether they care about the environmental future is a different question, but pragmatically, they need to know that they will not stay in Congress long if they don't sign on to a plan like this. And so you can do that by contacting them. You can also show up and participate in the next set of protests, much like in the footage we just showed you. So on, uh, I believe it's December 10th, they're planning uh, their next big action. They're gonna be heading to, to Washington with as many people as possible, hopefully hundreds, if not thousands, not just to protest outside of uh, Nancy Pelosi's office, but as many representatives as possible to get as many to sign up as possible so that we have a real chance of passing a Green New Deal and addressing the climate change threat, what's causing Greenland to melt in the way that it is. Okay, uh, you know, coincidentally, actually, we have an awesome guest coming on in the next block to talk about this. Kate Aronoff, contributor to The Intercept, is going to be talking about the Green New Deal. What could the country look like if we actually do what we need to do and get it? We'll break that down after this. 
Welcome back to the show, everyone. So I feel like probably a couple of times a week, I sketch out what an apocalyptic hellscape our world could become if we don't stand up to the threat of climate change, if we simply surrender and allow uh, you know, the, the carbon emissions and the way we generate electricity to destroy our planet. Um, but let's switch gears for a second. What would the world actually look like if we do meet that threat, if we do what is necessary to deal with climate change, Kate Aronoff, contributor to The Intercept, recently wrote an article about that possible future, and uh, we welcome her now to the show. Kate, welcome to The Damage Report. Thanks for having me. Uh, very glad to have you here. So uh, as I said, you recently wrote an article uh, looking a couple of decades into the future if we had a Green New Deal. So uh, what world uh, could, could we possibly be living in? Well, I think, you know, it, on some level it remains to be seen, but the kind of basic tenets of it are that we could uh, have shorter work weeks, we could have a functional mass transit system for folks who live in New York, the MTA could actually work maybe, mm -hmm. uh, beautiful, affordable, rent-controlled public housing, uh, uh, you know, a job where our bosses aren't screwing us over, um, sort of any number of things you can imagine, Medicare for all, um, can sort of fit under this green umbrella. And most importantly, uh, the planet wouldn't be burning around us and, and sort of baking us all into a, into a hellscape future. Look, that all sounds great. So uh, for, for people who might be new to this idea of the Green New Deal, um, what, what might confuse them is that a lot of what you just talked about there and a lot about, of what you write about in your article doesn't explicitly have anything to do with climate change. And yet people who are you know, setting up these possible plans, they do talk about all of those things. So uh, why is it that a lot of the Green New Deal isn't just about you know, carbon capture or carbon taxes or something like that? Yeah, well, I think the thing to sort of keep in mind when talking about that is that, you know, every policy field over the next century, basically for the rest of, of human existence, will um, have something or other to do with climate change. And so whether that's foreign policy, immigration, healthcare, everything will be affected by the fact that um, temperatures are on track to rise by uh, anywhere from you know 1.3 to about 1.8 degrees um, at the rate we're currently going could rise as far as four to five degrees and so that has implications for everything and so essentially at this point everything you know we think of whether it's traditionally considered climate policy or not is climate policy and so you know it may not be um, building solar panels or um, putting up wind turbines or the sort of things we typically think about as, as falling within the, the confines of a green job or uh, being green in, in, in a proper sense. But, um, you know, every aspect of our life essentially has to transform and, and can really transform for the better. Um, but I think that's part of why um, people talk about a Green New Deal as being so expansive is simply because um, so many things have to change. Um, the scientists, you know, are, are getting increasingly clear about this and people have called it um, a sort of change in society's productive capacity. Um, and of course, that's because we have an economy that's been built around making sort of endless mountains of cheap stuff. <laughs> and uh, that's been fueled by fossil fuels. And so if we, we take that out of the equation, uh, more sort of changes than just where we get our power, um, that kind of changes the way we live our lives. And that doesn't, you know, have to be worse. That can be um, a really, you know, healthy change. If it's not, um, you know, the, the things you buy that necessarily make you happy, um, certainly, you know, having kind of beautiful public spaces, um, having access to high-speed rail or something like that, that can, you know, really sort of fundamentally change um change what life looks like and, you know, bring down the, uh, the, the amount of carbon that we're putting on into the atmosphere. Now, when we talk about some of these changes, I know the Republican response, some conservatives are worried that doing anything seriously about climate change would result in either losing jobs or lower economic growth. Um, but, but you've written a number of articles actually recently about sort of the myth that we can simply keep producing the way that we are right now and production can continue to go up. And so, so I wanna to talk to you about that. If we don't do anything, what are the actual costs that aren't often talked about in jobs, economic growth, you know, spending by the government and, and all of that? Yeah, I mean, the, the sort of baseline figure, if we do nothing and continue on the path we're on is hundreds of trillions of dollars, right? And so um, there was a study released just yesterday um, from the Institute for New Economic Thinking, which found that if we don't do anything about climate change, if we keep going the way we're going, um, that will lead 
lead inevitably to world economic collapse. And so to break that down a little bit, um, the National Climate Assessment released from 13 federal agencies several weeks ago um, found, you know, about uh, $118 billion, just looking at a figure there, um, from sea level rise, um, $32 billion of losses from um, infrastructure damage. Uh, by 2100, we would face losses double that caused by the Great Recession. And so I think that's really the terms that this debate has to be on. It's not, you know, where do we, um, how do we measure this up to where we are now, but how do we measure up any potential cost of climate action um, to both what's likely if we don't and to what we're spending currently in the fossil fuel industry. The IMF has estimated that fossil fuel subsidies amount to about $5.3 trillion per year. Wow. It's about $10 million per minute. And so we're already spending quite a lot of money to make climate change happen. Um, and it could be comparatively much cheaper to stop it um, and to not live through it. So it sounds like the Green New Deal might be the best bargain in, in politics at this point. Um, so I want to talk yeah. about what you're up to right now as well. Uh, I heard a little bit of conversation with our control room. So you're actually, you're not, you're not in New York right now, um, and you're doing something actually quite related to what we're talking about, actually. Can you describe that? Yeah, so I am in uh, Katowice, Poland, um, for COP24, which is the annual UN climate talks, um, where currently they are trying to figure out a rule book to, uh, that will inform how we implement the Paris Agreement. Okay, so obviously really important. I'm sure we'll help to inform your future reporting on this topic, something you come back to uh, quite often. I want to ask you one other question, uh, because you have been writing about this for quite a while. It, it, the Green New Deal in particular has uh, received quite a bit of media attention over the past few weeks, uh, thanks to the Sunrise Movement, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and others. Um, do you believe that the political will and the popular support for these sorts of policies uh, are things fundamentally changing? Are people more likely than in past years? And for what reasons to support these sorts of policies? I think absolutely. I mean, uh, if you look at, for instance, the polling on something like a green job guarantee, that enjoys um, majority support um, across states. So red states, blue states, whatever. Um, everyone is sort of on board with this. An increasing sort of majority of Americans are uh, excited about the prospect of climate action. So the real holdouts in this aren't sort of the American people or voters. Um, they are donors who, of course, sway members of both the Democratic and Republican, more so the Republican Party, of course. Um, and, you know, that is where this resistance is coming from. It's not sort of the resistance of, um, you know, a grand mass of people. It's a very, very small number of people who are actually um, vocally denying climate science anymore. That's not really where the debate is at. Um, what we have to worry about now is sort of the insane influence that the fossil fuel industry um, exerts on our politics. And I think once that is sort of taken care of um, or really challenged forcefully, which folks like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez are doing, um, I think we see a much different political atmosphere that is ready for something like a Green New Deal. Okay, well, hopefully, fingers crossed. And, uh, you know, Kate, I want to thank you both for your reporting on this topic, you know, just, not just the most recent article, but, but going back some time and uh, for joining us on the show today. Thank you so much. Thank you. We're gonna take one more break in the show. When we come back, uh, Donald Trump, obviously, he's at the, the funeral of George H.W. Bush. Uh, a little bit was captured in video that really goes to the heart of what his ideology, what his beliefs actually are, what he expresses in public versus what he actually appears to believe. We're gonna break that down after this. Welcome back, everyone. One more segment in today's edition of The Damage Report. By the way, tomorrow, we're gonna be closing out the week. Brett Ehrlich is gonna be back. He's the host of Happy Half Hour on this network. Obviously, great producer every day here. He's gonna be joining me. Uh, we're gonna be talking about a lot of stuff. I, I have a plan. I understand it's not related to politics or whatever, but the uh, Golden Globe nominations just came out, and I kinda wanna talk about them. So we might do that to close out the week. Just a little bit of uh, light stuff with some social implications based on who I've seen nominated, who I haven't seen nominated in some categories. So look forward to that to close out the week in tomorrow's edition of The Damage Report. Uh, but first, a little bit more for you in the politics world. People believe that Donald Trump is religious. I don't understand it at this point, but I'm gonna do my best to convince you that it is just an act. We're gonna be starting with uh, today. So the funeral going on for former President George H.W. Bush. And uh, some video was captured of an instance where a religious person would do one thing and an atheist might do another. Uh, let's take a look which direction Trump went in. Ended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. 
he ascended into heaven. So the reading of the Apostles' Creed. Look, if I if I was the Apostles' Creed, by the way, not Apollo Creed. People get that mixed up. If I was there, I wouldn't probably be repeating it too, even though I, I tend to try to fit in a social situation. So I'd be willing to. He has no interest. He's not looking at it. He's not saying anything, even though he's standing in a line of former presidents who are. Okay, maybe that's a small thing. Maybe that's not the strongest evidence. So let's go back a, a little bit further. We're gonna be looking at some evidence from recent, some as far back as uh, the, the primaries he was engaged in when some of the more obviously religious Republicans were trying to differentiate themselves from him. So first of all, kind of an important question for a religious conservative, does he go to church? Well, uh, he said he went to Marble Collegiate Church uh, in Manhattan, and uh, they told CNN back in August of 2015 that he's not an active member. Um, which is interesting and, and really not that surprising when you consider that he's a Presbyterian Protestant. They're a reformed church in America. And so he apparently went there with his family when he was much, much younger and doesn't go there. He's not an active member. He doesn't actually go to the church. And apparently he just remembered the church that his parents brought him to. Maybe his parents were religious. I honestly don't know. But if you claim to go to a church and you don't actually go there, that's a little bit odd especially in the context of Donald Trump. Donald Trump was the guy saying that Barack Obama is a Muslim, even though they'll, they'll go back and forth between he's a Muslim, a secret Muslim, also he goes to this radical Christian church that we find unacceptable. So I don't know exactly how that works. Maybe the way that they're radical is that their form of Christianity is actually Islam. But they were able to bounce back and forth. He doesn't even go to church. But when he has appeared at church for special events, some funny stuff has come up. So Trump and his wife Melania and two staffers took communion uh, when it was passed at a church. He momentarily confused, which comes up a lot in articles about Trump, mistook the silver plate circulated around the auditorium and dug several bills out of his pocket. I thought it was for offering, he said with a laugh to his staff. He contributed several minutes later when the offering plates were passed. I guess that's generous of him, but he did seem bizarrely cons like taken aback by something that if you go to church is a relatively common occurrence. Again, just to the question of does he actually go? So look, let's go to some video from Trump talking about this, uh, about two different aspects of going to church. Let's see what he said. Well, I go as much as I can always on Christmas, always on Easter, mm -hmm. uh, always when there's a major occasion, and during the during the Sundays. I'm a Sunday church person. We go in church, and and when I drink my little wine, which is about the only wine I drink, and have my little cracker, I guess that's a form of asking for forgiveness. Yeah, I guess it's a form, maybe. Um, okay, so I want to break down both of those. So first of all, uh, I always I try to go as much as possible on Christmas and a funeral or whatever. And then you can see he like he's not totally dense. He has a little bit of self-awareness. You can just you can view it in practice on his face. So he's saying he goes on church and then he realizes that doesn't sound good. So and Sundays, I go always on Sundays. Now, we know already that that's not true. The church says that he's not actually an active participant and that it sounds kind of bad when you say, "Oh, I'm totally religious, but I only go once a year." And look, the thing is, there are plenty of Christians in America that only go to church once a year, or even less, don't go at all. But they also don't go around saying that they are like the avatar for evangelical Christianity and should get the support of that block. That they are, in fact, more moral, more Christian, more religious than whack jobs like Ted Cruz, who appear to be true believers when it comes to that type of thing. So he can't have his little cracker and eat it too. And let's turn to that now. If you took this stuff seriously, and if you thought that the sacrament was the actual physical body and blood of Christ, would you call it your little wine and your little cracker? I don't think so. I might make an offhand comment like that, but that's why I'm banned from a lot of churches. Not Donald Trump, okay, and he's the one saying it in that video. More substantively, I guess, especially when it comes to born again Christians, the question of your know, forgiveness and you know, prostrating yourself before God, asked if he's ever asked God for forgiveness, he said, I don't think so ever, ever in his whole life, and just for fun, asked whether he's drawn more to the New Old Testaments, he says both. And somewhere, Sarah Palin read that and thought, nailed it. <laughs> That's the easiest question ever. Okay, I don't even care which direction you go in. Say new, say old. A lot of Americans will probably think that you're right, but you can't say both because they're mutually exclusive. Some of the foundational stuff is similar. But like they needed a New Testament because of the deficiencies in the old. So either you're sticking with Leviticus or you kind of like that Sermon on the Mount stuff. But he 
I like it all, you know? I like the new, I like the old, the Quran, the Torah, give me it all, baby, I love that stuff. Dianetics, I'm a big fan. And that's what he said, and despite that, he won eight in 10 evangelicals in America. Just amazing the country we live in, the hypocrisy that's allowed. Anyway, that's all the time we have. Thank you for joining us on The Damage Report. We'll be back tomorrow with more for you to close out the week. Thank you for listening to The Damage Report podcast, the show covering the true threats facing our country and what you can actually do about them. You can support this free podcast by leaving us a review and giving us a five star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you happen to be listening to it. Every review helps more people discover the show at no cost to you. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad free, access members only bonus content and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.